Okay. So on general inspection, patient is standing comfortably. On closer inspection, with both patella facing forward, I don't see any obvious corona malalignment. Otherwise, around the patient's feet, there's no obvious swelling, scar, skin changes. No obvious wasting of the uh, muscles. Alright, uh, SWAD. Any obvious uh, deformity. Look at the toes. Any hallux vulgus. Any lesser toe deformities. For example, hammer toe, mallet toe, claw toe deformity. Alright. Then you look at the medial arch. Medial longitudinal arch. So there's a collapse of the medial longitudinal arch bilateral feet. Alright. Now sometimes. Not a universal and not a generally acceptable way, but in UM, sometimes we use this one finger. Have you been taught before? Yeah. Mm. To slide it underneath the arch. So usually up to around here. So if you cannot enter at all, it's flat foot. If you can enter all the way beyond that, it's a high arch foot. Mm. But uh, some uni may not like it also. Huh? Alright, so then you go towards the back. Okay, can you show that? Okay, alright. Towards the back, so you can see that this is possibly just about normal. This is a genu vul uh, this is a hind foot vulgus. Alright. Usually it's about four to five degree. Again, uh, vulgus is like this. Go down and then go like this. This is called vulgum. Four to five degree. But definitely you can see that on his right side is excessive hind foot vulgum. So you just mentioned that it's an excessive hind foot vulgum. Alright. So then after that you ask the patient to walk. Uh, and then, oh sorry, before that. Is there any too many toe sign? More than one and a half toes. From the back, you see whether there's more than one and a half toes or not. So from here, I can see like two toes there. Here, not really. Here, just about one to one and a half, like that borderline, like that. That's what I'm saying. Here, definitely. Here, it's about two toes, two to two and a half. Like and there's too many toe signs present. All right, now, we'll just walk there. Just walk and come back. Okay, alright. So the gait is normal. Lah. Sometimes they can have pain in the antalgic gait. If you've got a hallux vulgus, it's deviated in front, right? So you see your heels right, mid-stern, toe off, right? They won't have proper toe off because they will have pain at the hallux vulgus. Yeah. So just report as it is. There's an absence of the heels right or there's an absence of a toe off. There's an antalgic gait. It's coming, alright? Then after that, you ask the patient, like I said, normally I will usually ask the patient to squat. Lah. Can you squat down? Okay. okay, come. Okay, good. Now, you sit at the couch. Last time I used to examine my foot and ankle patient, uh, ask them to lie down. But uh, uh, it has been uh, corrected to uh, sitting the patient at the age of the bit. And after that, uh, examine the patient. Because all the other uni, they examine patient, foot and ankle patient in this way. So let's say I'm just going to focus on the right side. Alright, so as you come closer, then you're going to comment again on closer inspection of the foot. What do you see now that you don't really see just now is medial border, lateral border, and the plantar aspect of the foot. So then you say, on closer inspection of the patient's foot along the medial border, lateral border, over the plantar aspect, any callosity, any ulcer. Then you open up the web space. Any web space infection, fungal infection at the web space. Okay? Any dystrophic near changes because now you can see closer, closer inspection. Then you feel. Same approach only. Orthopedic look, feel move. Any increase in warm. Okay? Then after that you feel for tenderness. Okay? Alright. So if the patient has got a fat foot, where do you think the tenderness is going to be? It'll be here, along the posterior tibialis tendon, during the early stage. During the early stage, alright? Now, as it progresses, the patient will start to have pain here. Subfibular impingement, you see? Just an excessive vulgar, right? So it will impinge here on the lateral aspect. So early stages, they will have inflammation and posterior tibialis tendinitis here. As it becomes worse and worse, and then they will have subfibular impingement, they will have uh, tenderness over here. Alright, so you palpate uh, all the other areas, go to the tender side, the last side. Uh. Okay, palpate, palpate. So any pain, palpate around the bone, soft tissue. 
of it and then this is a posterior tibiae tendon uh, posterior tibiae tendon got nine attachment all right so but basically it attached to the navicular here nine different sets of attachment for posterior tibiae tendon all right all right so after you feel ready after that you're gonna move all right standard so go up go down go in and go out okay finish then after that, now it's very a la carte already at this point of time. All right. If it's a flat foot, then you go to the flat foot. If it's hello swagger, you do a hello swagger examination. If it's a mid foot arthritis, then you do your grinding test. So all very very a la carte here. Yeah. But <clears throat> you say flat foot, for example. So <clears throat> so flat foot three tests. All right. The first test is tenderness along your posterior tibialis tendon. Okay. Number two. Mm -hmm. Posterior tibialis tendon, the function is plantar flex and invert. That's a function of posterior tibialis tendon. So you want to check any weakness of that muscle. How you check? Can you go down and then go in and then tahan me? They will be weak. Okay? Yeah, they got a PTTI. Next, the third test for the PTTI or PTTD. Alright? So, your dorsiflex and evert in the opposite direction. Just like you plant the flex and invert, right? Now your dorsiflex and evert to stretch the tendon and they will complain of pain around the PT, posterior tibialis tendon. Alright, so that is a three test for posterior tibialis tendon. Okay. If it's a midfoot arthritis, here you got arthritis and all that. So what you do is that you stabilize the heel, you grab the forefoot, and you grind it. Load and grind any pain for midfoot arthritis. Sometimes they can have this uh, MTPJ arthritis called hallux rigidus. Same thing only. Grind it and then go up and down. See whether they got pain or not. This is your MTPJ. Yeah. The arthritis. If there's a hallux vulgus, you try to correct it back or not. See whether the hallux vulgus is correctable or not. Then second thing what you do, you do the ballotment test. Okay, ballotment, thumb, thumb, place it on the first and the second metatarsal. Your, <coughs> your eyes are going to be in the same plane as this one. Alright, of your foot. You place it here and then you do this ballot. If it is more than 9 millimeter, it means that it is unstable. Where is the unstable? Here. Between your medial cuneiform and your first metatarsal. Why we do that? Because that will guide our management. If it is unstable here, even if we have a hallux, uh, rig uh, hallux vulgus, that hallux vulgus. Yeah, hallux vulgus. Okay, so then you need to fuse it here. It's called lapidus procedure. Okay, so very a la carte, very a la carte here. Huh? But usually it's a posterior tibialis tendon, and then here. And then uh, anterior drawer, posterior drawer, uh, no posterior drawer, anterior drawer, alright. So what I can show you is that, you know that here, if they got an ankle sprain, alright, not during the acute stage, uh, acute stage painful swelling that you can't be, you won't really see, but chronic ACL, uh, chronic instability of the lateral ankle, you know that here you got your ATFL, anterior talofibular ligament, CFL and PTFL, right. We can check ATFL and CFL. But not PDFL. ATFL, how to check? Hold it like this. Hold it like this, huh? Here, stabilize it. You do an anterior drawer test in a plantar flex position. Plantar flex position, you see? Here, plantar flex. Here, translate anteriorly. Eh, you also got a bit, huh? Is it? Can feel it? <laughs> I can feel the capital. Huh? You can hear the sound? Yeah, okay. So this is an ATFL, ATFL plantar fat. Now when you go like this, plantigrade, and then you do the anterior translation, that's to test your CFL. That's for your lateral ankle instability. Okay, all right, so very much a la carte. Hmm. That's ankle, and then ankle, up there, nothing much systemic features, nothing to screen. Also, probably just the knee, lah, eh? adjacent joint. Just palpate a bit, then ROM flexion extension. It should be fine.
uh, DPA PTA lor, uh, yang pape DPA PTA. Alright, that's for the. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot one thing very important. The single hue rice test. Uh, okay, alright. So the hue rice test, what you want to test is the integrity of your posterior T belly standard. So actually, just now at the end of the walking, I should do the. Uh, Heel rise test first before I ask the patient to sit up. So, can you turn? Mm. Okay. In case if you're going to fall down, then you just hold on to it. Lah. So, what I need you to do is to later tiptoe on both sides. So, when you ask the patient to tiptoe on both sides, you want to look for two things. That the hind foot vulgus upon tiptoeing go into various. If you notice your, your normal foot, when you tiptoe, it goes into various. Huh? Your actually standard like that go into various. All right. And the second thing you want to look at is the reconstitution of your medial longitudinal arch. Previously no arch. Once the patient tiptoe, then got arch. So that means if it is like that, it's flexible. It's not rigid. However, if it doesn't reconstitute, or the hind foot vulgus does not go into various, then that means that it's rigid. Okay. All right. Now let's see how. This one is flexible or rigid. Okay, <clears throat> now both side tiptoe. What what do you say? The hind foot. Yeah, become various already. Left side also various. The arch is back already. So these are two bilateral flexible flat foot. Okay, all right. Now we do one side by one side. All right. So now can you just do tiptoe on one side? See whether he is able to do or not. Yes, okay. go back into various also, and then the other side. Okay, so all normal. Okay. Okay. So there's a few right steps. You do both first, and then you do one side, normal side first, and then do abnormal side. Normal is hind foot vulgus 4 to 5 degrees, but during the heel rise, uh, for normal people, it should go into various. Okay, all right. So if the patient has got a flexible flat foot, all right. So we try with the conservative first, medial shoe insole with a medial arch support, huh? and give some uh, N6 anti-inflammatory medication as necessary. Uh, if it doesn't improve and it is still flexible, you can do this tenosynovectomy surgery. That means that you open up. You wash because it's inflamed, right? The tendon. So you wash a little bit. You can detach and then reattach back the tendon. If not, then you need to do much more uh, extensive surgery. If fail, if it's rigid and all that, you need to do both bony and soft tissue procedure, tendon transfer and all that, which you don't have to know. So two thirds of the cases of a past cavus is due to neurogenic causes. The other one third is non neurogenic. The non-neurogenic causes are, for example, your residual CTEV, which has not been corrected, so continue to have this high arch foot. Second, midfoot trauma, need to midfoot arthritis and all that, or previous compartment syndrome of your midfoot can all go into past cavus. Those are the non-neurogenic causes. Neurogenic causes, you divide them into central nervous system, for example, the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system. The brain, you got your spine, uh, brain tumor, you got your uh, stroke, you got your fright rich ataxia. Nah, these are at the brain. Spinal cord, you got your uh, spinal cord tumor, nah, your stringomyelia, all right, which is a string in your this one, a uh, uh, fluid field cyst in your spinal cord. And then after that, you talk about your peripheral nerve, which is a uh, poliomyelitis, and also your charcot marie tooth disease. So that is where the charcot marie tooth disease fit into the place. Uh, so it is one of the neurogenic causes but arising from the peripheral nervous system. So when they come to you with a past cavus, uh, instead of being specific to charcot marie tooth, but rather you should do a, a neurology examination on it, lower limb. For example, you inspect already and then after that you ask the patient to walk and after that you lie the patient down. Do Tone, power, reflex, sensation of the lower limb. Because if it's coming from the spinal cord tumor and brain, all right, you will be hypertonia, hyperreflexia. 
if it's a hypotonia and all that, then you're thinking about poliomyelitis. You're thinking about charcot marie tooth disease. That's how you come into this one. All right. And only after that, <clears throat> if you are quite sure that, oh, okay, this is likely a lower motor neuron lesion. But because poliomyelitis, their sensory is normal, but their muscle is atrophy, weaker, smaller. All right. But their sensory is normal. So when the sensory is abnormal, then you think about charcot marie tooth. Understand? So first, you see whether it's hypertonia, hyperreflexia or not. If it is, you think about the brain and the spinal cord. If not, then you look at your, uh, if it's a lower motor neuron lesion, then you'll check the sensation. Sensation normal, poliomyelitis. Sensation abnormal, usually along your common peroneal nerve. Uh, this is a charcot marie tooth. Charcot marie tooth will tend to affect, if it's a lower limb, common peroneal nerve. If it is an upper limb, it will tend to affect ulnar nerve. So having said that, after you check your, you think that it's a charcot marie tooth, then you should go to the hand and look for ulnar claw and hypotenar muscle wasting. Yeah, so that's your approach to uh, pass cables and charcot marie tooth.